You're listening to Winnipeg's Classic 107. My name is Simon Rusnak. It's the first Friday of the month of October. With a crispness in the air and the leaves changing and starting to fall off the trees, we welcome back Chris Hall from McNally Robinson Booksellers to the studio for the latest edition of What to Read. Wonderful to have you here, Chris. Good morning, Simon. Uh, coming off a busy few weeks at McNally, how did all the events go since you were last <laughs> so in the far, studio? So far, so good. They've all been uh, very good, yeah. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I know those events continue both in person at mm-hmm. McNally as well as virtual events. And one that you're even going to be hosting at the end of this month, too. It just it doesn't stop over yeah, at the exactly. store, does it? Jan Kalman Stefansson, who was what to read in February. If yes, I was, attention. I, was, I was looking back <laughs> and uh, incredible that he is going to be coming here yeah. to town. I mean, yeah. we have such an incredible Icelandic community that we were talking yeah. about uh, yeah. back in that what to read. Um, he not a part of this month's What to Read feature. (laughs) Plenty of other names uh, to introduce or reintroduce to the Mm -hmm. the listening audience. And we're going to begin with a a Pulitzer Prize finalist, a National Book Award winner. Um, Let's uh, bring things rather close to home uh, to begin things here. Yeah, somewhat. The novel is called The Mighty Red. It is by Louise Erdrich, and she is a uh, familiar name, I'm sure. I think I've chosen the last several books Mm -hmm. by Erdrich as a What to Read. The Sentence, The Night Watchman most recently. I'm a big fan. So this new one is set in Argus, North Dakota. A group of people are gathering. Um, there's a wedding, but the wedding is fraught. There's uh, there's certainly one bride, but there's, I don't know, I guess not two grooms, but two young men determined to be the groom. Suitors, yes. <laughs> <That's>, absolutely. <laughs> uh, there's Gary Geist. He's uh, desperate to marry uh, uh, a young lady named uh, Kismet Poe. Kismet Poe is a lapsed goth. Um, she's also being pursued by Hugo, who is a gentle red-haired giant and uh, just as determined. So it's it's kind of it's got a silly aspect to it. These the, it's the the characters are very like it's a very light take, I guess, on these lives. But at the same time, it's it's also engaging in some big questions. Questions about time a lot, human time, Red River time, uh, the half life of herbicides and pesticides, and then big questions for humans like falling in love, overcoming tragedy. But at the same time, these um, it's almost slapstick. It's if they the characters are very fun and 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 uh, um, light. So it's this interesting combination of things. And yes, the the mighty red is the Red River. Winnipeg gets a mention. Um, it, the uh, set in uh, as Erdrich's, I think all of her books are set in uh, in uh, reservation in in Minnesota, where is very close to the the source of the Red River. Uh, very fascinating indeed. And I, I know when I saw this title on the list, I thought, it, is it that red? Mm-hmm. Like the one that yeah. we know? So very yeah. fascinating that you've kind of picked a title that brings it close to home. Mm-hmm. I, I also looked up uh, Argus just north of Fargo, I think is where that oh, one okay. is. Oh, okay. I didn't do that. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it looks like a, a small town, one that will be familiar, I think, to many if you've traveled through the Red River Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, the next title is one from this month's Author of the Month at McNally, right? That's right, yes. Alan Hollinghurst. Uh, his new novel is called Our Evenings. 20 years ago, if you can believe it, I can't believe it, Hollinghurst won the Booker Prize. Uh, he had a novel called The Line of Beauty, and it was it was amazing. It uh, captured everyone's attention. He spent the years since that. He's created a number of well-crafted, well-received novels. They haven't garnered that level of attention, but he has been quietly producing a lot of quality novels. Uh, the new novel, it centers on a fellow named Dave Wynn. He's the son of a British dressmaker and a Burmese man he has never met. He earns a scholarship, Dave does, to go to a top uh, uh, boarding school. And uh, there he runs into the possibilities that come with that, but also the viciousness is of his privileged classmates. He, uh, he is not as, he's not white as they are. And so, and they don't treat him very well. So that's the start. He f- follows this, the story of Dave. That's, um, from the 1960s when he gets that, uh, opportunity right through the rest of his life. And until he's an older Londoner, late in life marriage, uh, finds him happy and secure. Uh, but along the way, one of his former classmates has had a career, uh, developed a career as a powerful right-wing politician. And so mm. it's a novel about p- people, these two people in particular, but also about these ideas that come together towards the end of the novel. It almost t- turns, I wouldn't call it a suspense novel, but there's an s- element of suspense in it as to what is going to result from these two people, but also these, these sets of ideas coming together. Uh, both of these uh, two novels kind of really focus on very personal interactions with people mm-hmm. and, and their lives with some broader implications. 
the the first the mighty red you kind of described it almost slapstick ish mm -hmm. is this uh latest from hollinghurst a, a sort of quieter read is it mm -hmm. more yeah, yeah it wouldn't be at all kind of comparable that way in terms of how the, no, the characters no. develop it, it was a bit of a surprise to have erdrich go that way yeah i, I mean not that she's you know um solemn or anything in her other novels but this one was remarkably light but um no hollinghurst i would use that word i have often um i love the novels that quiet the world yeah and i get into it but uh yeah they're very reflective very uh, very quiet yeah uh where are we going next uh it is a very diverse reading list uh, just to tease <laughs> uh, and keep listeners engaged it is uh, right. a very chris uh hall special if i, I could like sum to, it up that way yeah i like to call it pushing myself <laughs> around the store exactly. so here we go we're off to the science slash biography slash history section um this uh, is a, a non-fiction book obviously called the elements of mary curie how the Glow of Radium Lit a Path for Women in Science. And it is by an author named Deva Sobel. And again, we're reaching back into my career as a bookseller back in, um, which started in the closing days of the last century. How profound is that? Eh? <laughs> um, Deva Sobel, she wrote a book called Longitude, which sold like crazy. And I remember reading it. It was a fascinating mm. book about how navigators, um, the, the world really changed when they were able to figure out how to keep track of the long longitude of their travels. She followed that up with a book called Galileo's Daughter and then others. She's now back with the story of Mary Curie. And as Sobel says, for nearly a century after her death, she remains the only female scientist, scientist most people can name. Uh, Curie was the sole Nobel laureate um, awarded in two separate fields of science, physics in 1903 with her husband, but then again in chemistry by herself in 1911. And this is the story of her life, both inside and outside the laboratory. But it's not a straight ahead biography like you might suppose. It takes a unique approach. It comes at, um, it comes at Curry through um, a number of uh, ob subjects, um, most, mostly women who, um, I guess, benefited from her legacy, including her own daughter, Irene, who herself won the Nobel Prize in chemistry mm -hmm. in 1935. Not only that, but each chapter is named for one of the elements of the periodic table, thus the elements of Mary Curie of the title. Very clever. And it is very clever, mm -hmm. and it, it creates this whole community of women that are not remembered well, but uh, who've made significant contributions to scientific knowledge, but also brings in her fascination in the laboratory, and a number of them discovered some of these elements. Um, you mentioned doesn't read like a straight ahead, bland sort of biography mm -hmm. at all, no. um, which can just, I mean, it makes people come to life, doesn't mm -hmm. it? But especially yeah, it when you're along just a, uh, for the ride. Yeah. Um, so a uh, very exciting uh, biography there. Um, now for something totally different. <laughs> Tell us about right. the franchise. That's right. Off to the sports section yeah, here slash we go. business section, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, the franchise, the business of win of building winning teams by a fellow named Craig Custance. And last year, there was a book that came out called Draft Day, and it, it undertook detailing the process um, that NHL teams take to, uh, to um, select the right players mm -hmm. in, the, in the NHL draft. This is a different author, but it's something of a companion book. It, the author works for The Athletic, which is an online uh, sports writing company. Uh, he's interviewed some of the biggest names in the NHL who work behind the scenes, most uh, in management almost entirely. And what they're trying to do is build the best teams that we watch every winter and then on into the spring, the best of the best. So everyone from the current Leafs GM, Brad Treliving, to former Leafs GM, Kyle Dubas, Lou Lamarillo, who won, has won several mm -hmm. cups, Julian Brisbois, the architect of the Lightning's uh, winning season. So we often hear players, they'll recognize that it's a business, and uh, but this goes uh, much farther into what that business is. It's um, it, They usually mention it when they're signing contracts. Well, these are the people on the other side who are trying to sign them to contracts. And there's disagreement sometimes about what the worth should be and the, the length of time they should be signing these contracts to. They are tough decisions, um, how much to offer, um, when to let a player go. So these are the uh, people who um, make those decisions and they talk a lot about their principles, the guiding principles that allow them to make um, 
decisions within like these tough situations. So it's a great business book yeah. for anybody running a, a, a business with a group of people, but also for the NHL fan who wants to take a deep dive into what is that business side? How does that work? It's uh, quite, it's, it was fascinating. Yeah, and chatting with some absolute, um, I mean, marquee talent in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, GMs, Kyle Dubas and, and Trey yeah. Living and, and, and yeah. Lou Lamarillo. Um, the big question here, uh, Chris, is uh, is this one that you're going to pass along to Kevin Cheveldeoff? Yeah. Or is he going to be welcomed asked, into the store? I will, I've been asked that more than once. So, <laughs> I'm sure you uh, if have. If he's listening, I will gladly. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things you've been talking about is kind of making your way throughout the store, exploring different sections. And I feel like as someone who pops into McNally to get a new read, I go to my spot. Mm. You know what I mean? I, mm -hmm. I know which section I want to go to. I know what I want to grab. Mm -hmm. And then I make my way out. And sometimes I peruse the store. I mean, there's always something to see and something to check out, but you're really taking us around the store in unique fashion. So um, we're off to some self-improvement, inspiration, <laughs> psychology reading now to close things out. Yeah, really, that's... really all over here. Yeah. This is one of those books. It's hard to know where to put it yeah. in the store. It, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is called How to Winter, Harness Your Mindset to Thrive on Cold, Dark, and Difficult Days. It's by Kari Leibovitz. Now she grew up in New Jersey uh, she graduated university with a psychology degree. Um, not a fan of winter at the time, and nor were her friends. It was always something to endure. Well, she set off to do some research in Tromso, Tromsø, Norway, uh, home of the northernmost university in the world. And she set out to explore what the relationship is between these cold, dark days and the mm -hmm. rates of depression and and so on that she she was feeling. The trouble was when she got to Tromso, she found very low rates of depression. These were not depressed people. And instead, she became fascinated by the positive relationship that they had there um, with what is generally thought of as the least popular season. So she changed direction. She explored the relationship between what she calls a winter mindset and low levels of depression. That, that winter mindset includes being mindful of the opportunities that winter has for activities. You gather around fires, you can rest and live with the rhythms of the natural world and cozy evenings in, in that darkness. I was reminded again that when I had kids, I was reminded of how much fun winter is. It's hmm. the first day of snow is the best day of the year for, for kids. And so it, it's something like that that is the mindset she's, she's uh, recommending that um, if you prepare to look on the bright side rather than the gloomy, you can have a good time. You just have to take winter on its terms, get out and enjoy it. A uh, great reminder for us Winnipeggers. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we're we kind of known to make the most of those winters, as you were saying. Um, not so much enduring, but tackling them head on. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, really embracing the possibilities that the darkness and the cold provide. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. we have such incredible creative communities here. Yeah. And a lot of that is attributed to maybe these colder times where we're a little bit more reflective and, and looking inward and, and spending time honing our craft, but also getting out there and trying to make the most of the season. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's something, though, that Winnipeggers could take from from this read. You're very much teeing so. up the season that is to come. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I've been so impressed. The Forks has done such a great job of celebrating winter. You totally. can go and skate and ski and toboggan and, and just have a hot chocolate, uh, you know, outside. It's, uh, yeah, rather than just being ashamed, yes, we have winter. No, it's, it's actually great fun. Just watch your kids. Uh, there's so much that happens. I mean, I think of the Winnipeg New Music Festival that goes on that the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra puts on. I mean, it's during the coldest time of the year. Mm -hmm. We're inviting all of these distinguished composers <laughs> to come and yeah. experience the cold. Uh, so yes, I mean, harnessing that winter mindset, a good reminder, especially as we're starting to feel the change in the seasons, uh, a little bit of, uh, well, I mean, the jet season begins mm -hmm. next week, I think. Mm -hmm. So tackling that and so much more. A little bit of everything this month, Chris. <laughs> uh, appreciate it. As always, you can find Chris's picks up on the website later today. Classic one com or mcnallyrobinson.com. You can visit them in store, in person at uh, Grant Park or the second floor of the Forks Market or online from anywhere at mcnallyrobinson.com. Chris, thanks for being here. Thank you, Simon.